Okay, so we are live. Thank you once again. Uh, Mr. Kostas Kalgerakis from Hellenic Blockchain Hub is going to start this uh, uh, this session by giving us an introduction to what you do there. And then we will follow with the pilot's presentations and the feedback uh, from uh, all the partners. Uh, so thank you once again, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Fodori. I will uh, go straight to the to a short presentation of uh, Hellenic Blockchain Hub, which uh, I represent. Uh, so just give me a second to share my screen great so uh, okay. sorry sorry for being late but i had a huge problem to connect it's, it's okay right. don't it's worry we just started yeah we just started we just uh, i'm just uh, giving a brief overview of uh, hbh uh it's uh, a stakeholder in this in infinity infinite tech project that i think uh can add value and uh, it's a it's a community of um, of uh, blockchain enthusiast DLT enthusiasts in Greece. It's basically a knowledge. It's basically a knowledge network uh, of. Uh, let me. Can I? You don't see it now. Now it moves. Okay. So uh, it's it's a knowledge network for the promotion of decentralized open technologies. <coughs> and so it, it uh, started in back in uh, 2018 beginning of uh, 2018 um just people from uh, various organizations who would like to to explore more of the blockchain and uh, dlt potential uh, and uh, we try what we what tries to do <coughs> what it tries to do is to to activate uh various groups and uh, engage various groups of uh, stakeholders in this space from the public sector to the private sector to developers startups volunteers academia and so on and this this is inspired also by other kind of i have some difficulty in changing the slide okay so the, this is uh this is these are ju just of some of the similar blockchain associations that exist around the world so we have some <clears throat> inspiration from all these uh, different uh, associations there are many more of course uh but uh, the basic three pillars of uh, hb8 is to promote to educate and to consult so uh for all these stakeholders i mentioned before we we try as a uh, having blockchain hub to do th these three uh things uh and uh, to achieve that, we've done some uh, some uh, activities throughout the years from the from 2018 uh, on co on community building, uh, which is uh, you know uh, conferences, workshops, uh, educational content, uh, creation of uh, uh, social of social media of media channels, and some formulation of a national strategy uh, through SEV um and uh, in general we support we are there for any hackathon that uh, has some dlt element in it w i will not go into details on the on all these uh, examples but you can see that there were some uh, pre covid uh, meetups physical meetups that uh, went uh, online right after covid uh and we're in general we are quite active in uh, any uh, DLT and blockchain related event uh, and we are organize our own events uh, and uh, for example we have participated in a decentralized event by U University of Nicosia we have some um, <clears throat> I've personally uh, conducted a TEDx talk on uh, the on basic concepts of blockchain and DLT for TEDx uh, Komotini uh in general we support hackathons as i said so uh we are quite an active community it was much more active i would say before covid because this helps to bring people together uh but nevertheless during okay we had we had a, a policy paper uh, for sev that we provided some uh, directions and consultation and did some uh, workshop with its members and uh, this is a, these are two online sessions uh, uh, conferences on blockchain uh, we co-organized with Busies that went very very well 
they're very well regarded and uh, it's uh, one of the key blockchain um, <clears throat> events uh, in Greece uh, every once a year. So um, yeah, hope uh, the third one is coming soon. Uh, okay, we have some uh, nice figures um, that are in our database, let's say, and we have signed some memorandum of understanding and uh, with these supporters, uh, we, we have some quite prominent uh, institutions uh big companies uh and uh, other networks that uh, uh we are connected to um of course we have all the relevant uh, uh digital assets in, on facebook linkedin website and so on there is this central uh, email where you can reach us and um, of course that i think that's it uh, this is that was um what I wanted to share, um, uh, seeing all all these um, all these four these four uh, pilots. One of them is in NBG, which is uh, where I was uh, working for uh, for ten years. I think all, all of them have a very good scope, and uh, um, they 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 tackle very crucial pain points of the bank. Uh, of a bank and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm looking forward to see the results the, the end results of this of these uh, pilots um, yeah for NBG it's about investment portfolio management um, but, but all, all, all four are uh, very interesting and uh, hopefully they will uh, provide some um, nice input that could be replicated to many other institutions uh, that's it on my side uh, okay. thank you for inviting me for inviting a, a Helen blockchain hub uh, in this okay. workshop unfortunately as I said just because I'm very fresh in my new role <laughs> I will have to leave otherwise I would stay uh, until the end but you can uh, reach me um, through LinkedIn uh, or uh, through Helen blockchain hub uh, and, and if I can uh, be of any help, I will be glad. Thank you so much, uh, Costas. Uh, uh, Costas, here, I, I, if you don't mind, I'll jump in, Theo, and try and grab a question for Costas. First yeah. of all, would you be able to share the slides? Because that there is some good uh, material on how the community is developing on that. that, that uh, absolutely. Of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, Richard, I will share it. Uh, I'll send it to Theodoros, and he will uh, distribute the, the presentation. That'd be great. And just yeah. while we've got you, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing as the first sort of areas of real world blockchain applications? Um, are you seeing it in financial services or is it logistics or? Uh, the financial services are in the core of, uh, of this technology. So uh, definitely we're going th towards a uh, more, uh, the, Web3 and decentralized architecture, the stack is changing slowly, but okay, it will happen at some point. Uh, and besides that, definitely, as you said, uh, logistics and supply chain management is uh, a huge uh, area of uh, implementation because of the, because block, uh, the D DLT basically can uh, orchestrate uh, networks. And where do you have networks, you have uh, a good case for a use case for application. So uh, I agree with uh, these two that you mentioned. Of course, there is also energy sector. Uh, many other sectors can find use cases, but uh, I think these two are the main uh, the two main uh, areas. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Costas. You're welcome. Yeah. And Martin. Yes. Want to ask any question? Yes. Thank you, uh, Costas. Uh, very, very interested. Just a quick one, yeah, because uh, the idea is not to take too much time. In relation to regulations, right, and uh, legislations for blockchains, is there any progress? Because you know, although it's a technology that has been proven is functional, is going to revolutionize the, the way how we do things in security, in consent management. But there is still these gaps in regulations. Are you working in the hub with some partners to to influence or even create a new 
kind of a set of rules and influence the, the policies or what was what, the state of the art on that uh, yeah you're right there is a team uh, on the governing party uh, new democracy in greece that uh, um, consists of uh, blockchain experts and uh, they are looking on on it i mean but there's no uh, some uh, let's say um, specific uh, paper um, or or some uh, law or some regulation in in place they're just monitoring so far uh nothing uh, specific uh, um, unless on, if you go to on the european level you can find some initiatives but on a lock on, on a national level uh, here in greece i, I don't see any <laughs> progress it's a, it's a free field. <laughs> it's a green field for blockchains thank you you're welcome actually tell uh, can, can can we run first because neil has some uh, commitment, but uh, I don't know what's the agenda you prefer. But if it's of possible, course. just just let me know. So I, I will have to, to to log out. Thank you very much, and uh, all the best. Bye. Thank you again, Costas. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Let me share quickly uh, the agenda just for you to have an uh, an update on what we're gonna do. So we are gonna go through all the pilots. You were first anyway. Um, so the idea is to keep it uh, around 15 minutes or less if you want uh, and uh, by the end of that i will share the feedback forms so we can um, we can just give you uh, our feedback we also have a few questions that uh, they come from uh, costas and from a few different partners uh just quick questions on the specifics uh, for your presentation but you can start and we can take it from there um, so I'm gonna stop sharing. I don't know if who are you gonna start, Martin, with the presentation, or is Richard gonna start? Yeah, Martin's Martin. doing the presentation, and I'm doing the talking. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm close. <laughs> how, how 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 far are you away? <laughs> from I'm trying to do the same, but it's hard. Good. So good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Neil Giles. I'm um, the lead player, the director of Traffic Analysis Hub, um, which is an anti-human trafficking initiative that began uh, in 2017 with the support then of IBM. Um, uh, and it, it, its genesis um, is it goes back way further um, when we recognize that the crime of human trafficking and exploitation in all of its facets, so that's in labor markets uh, as well as commercial sexual exploitation, uh, we recognize that it was um, so hidden um, that, um, uh, that it was very difficult for law enforcement to investigate effectively. Um, and, and even now, the numbers of investigations across the globe are minimal. Um, uh, compared to the scale of the problem. Um, and, and there was a very poor understanding of the scale and nature of human trafficking uh, as it affect, affected nation states, but also as it affected um, business sectors and communities. Um, and, and so we began a journey uh, to try and, um, and understand um, how trafficking and exploitation worked in great detail. And why it worked. Um, I'm um, a, a professional law enforcement person by by background. My last job was as deputy director of the United Kingdom's National Crime Agency, um, and spent 36 years in law enforcement working across the world, um, principally in narcotics investigations in history, um, but um, but in as I say in the last. 15 or so years I've specialized in this area of criminality. Um, I, was, um, I was present in 1984 as a, as a young detective in Scotland Yard in the UK um, when the, uh, the legislation to follow the money first arrived. Uh, and, my, and my senior manager um, presented this new legislation to to my team um, uh, and confidently predicted that organized crime would be shut down in five years. Um, so that would have been 1989. Um, and here we are in 2022 
uh, and we're still trying to find how to follow the money um and and i think that essentially is is the um is the reason for my journey with you in infinitech it's the reason for um for our bringing what essentially is the largest repository of trafficking narratives the experience of victims properly classified and accessible uh, in a single data hub um bringing that material to this program so that we can begin um, to translate it into a language, a bank system, a transaction monitoring system, a know your customer system, other customer due diligence practice systems um, can interpret and effectively highlight which customers and which transactions are worthy of further scrutiny. Um, uh, 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 because only through that level of transparency will we begin to find the transaction patterns and the networks of payments that represent the crime of human trafficking, but also um, also begin to offer many more opportunities for authorities to identify uh, and and frankly rescue the victims of human trafficking around the world. Um, I have an example to share with you. Um, about five years ago, some partners of ours were uh, dealing with um, women from Southeast Asia in a European country um, who were claiming to be the victims of human trafficking. And they could not get traction with law enforcement in respect of this investigation, despite the fact that they they shared it with them. The women would not give evidence. That That's a key issue here. Victims of human trafficking find it very difficult to give evidence against their, their, their perpetrators, principally because their perpetrators tend to be connected to their home, to their family, to their parents, to their siblings, to their communities from which they come. And retribution will follow if they give evidence, so they don't. So we have to find an alternative opportunity to shut this crime down. Um, so we took this uh, investigation and a very small network chart of about three people um, and a couple of phone numbers to a financial institution. I'm happy to tell you it was Western Union. Um, uh, and two months later, Western Union had issued 74 suspicious activity reports in 16 national jurisdictions around the world and a, and a significant global investigation followed um, there were lots of prosecutions um, there was a significant shutdown of commercial sexual exploitation in two major cities in europe following this uh, following this investigation it was proof positive that if you do this properly you can make a real difference um, now, replicating that is hard. Um, you need an audience, you need the right material, um, and you need to give it to financial institutions in a way that they can consume. And, and there are many barriers between the work that I do uh, and an ability of a financial institution of any description, whether it's a payments platform, um, a, a deposit-taking bank, or a money service bureau, or, or even um uh, even cryptocurrency uh, provision uh, without the material arriving in a way that they can manage it, it's hard for them to to find time and resource to do and um, they're busy looking for russian oligarchs and billions of dollars hidden away in systems they're busy looking for politically exposed people uh, and and the amount of money is extraordinary just from human trafficking globally each year, $150 billion are the revenues that they should spot, and they spot virtually none. Um, so it's an easy win for us to get better. Um, uh, but uh, we joined this project, this program, because there is the potential to take that block of survivor experience and translate it into a transaction monitoring know your customer system that offers additional protections for those victims going forward, but offers the opportunity for those banks to identify criminal money flows 
that they can report to their financial investigation unit, financial investigation units at, at national bank level or um, national law enforcement level uh, as the law requires. Um, but it also enables them to make better business decisions about who they bank and how they bank. Um, and, and that's the, the key to the future. I, I talk about $150 billion from the crime of human trafficking. Um, I, I spent the day yesterday with United for Wildlife, uh, the global program to, um, uh, to protect uh, rare species um, and to prevent the trade in rare animals and rare animal products. Um, that's another $100 billion a year business. Um, and, and the $150 billion I've talked to you about human trafficking is, is a poor estimate. It's at least half a trillion dollars. Um, and when you add the other crime types, all of that money moves through financial systems unseen and unchecked. Uh, and what we're doing here is the first step towards changing that situation, making financial institutions much less liable to abuse. Um, which is what criminal transactions are. They're abusive of, of the system. Um, so what's, what's my aim from, from this work? Um, it's to build a, a greater audience of financial institutions. There are many thousands of them uh, uh, around Europe and around the world. Uh, at the moment, my access to financial institutions is limited by my capacity. Infinitech as a model for human trafficking and as a model for more crime types is an extraordinary opportunity to reach a very large audience very quickly in a way that it could consume data and produce results automatically and and at pace secondly it, it's it's a way of training financial systems on the basis of of, of the material we're beginning to offer it's a, it's a way of training financial systems to self-identify new typologies, new transaction patterns that need scrutiny uh, because criminals are smart. They constantly adjust their patterns of activity to ensure they get to keep their money, but they still want the money. Um, so that audience is, is the, the route that we're trying to develop through this work with you so that our ambition is much greater global reach for this material much faster response much greater ability to to capture um data that uh, gives us an opportunity to rescue people who are in exploitation but most of all it gives us that level of transparency that makes the business of trafficking and exploitation unviable and and that's the ultimate aim um, uh, and, and that aim is replicable in, in other crime type areas. Financial services are constantly evolving. Um, uh, uh, just traveling on a, an underground train in London yesterday, um, I, I saw adverts for money service practices, um, all using smartphones that are new um, and innovative um, and, uh, and clearly popular with certain segments of the population in the UK and I'm sure in many other countries. Um, the only way we keep pace with this is through this kind of automated um, conversation with payments platforms, with, with money service providers and, and deposit takers alike. And, and then we can develop our work uh, across a broader range of businesses because every business has a money laundering reporting officer um, and every business has the potential to hide transactions uh, in its in its day to day business activity. Um, the work we've been doing with this group, particularly with the Bank and Payments Federation of Ireland uh, and with the Bank of Ireland, um, who uh, have been one of the leading uh, entities uh, to, to get traction with what we're doing. Um, uh, it, it's an extraordinary opportunity that we mustn't let go of. Um, so um, there's room for other technology providers to bring their knowledge bases into this mix. 
um, uh, more than room, there's a great opportunity for, the, for them to bring um, their um, knowledge data sets uh, in alongside that of Traffic Analysis Hub. Uh, and, and the dream is that we grow this community ever larger. Currently, we are 120 organizations across the globe that use Traffic Analysis Hub to guide their activity. Um, automating access to that for financial institutions, of which there are 10 currently in the user set, um, is, is a key performance indicator for, for our work going forward. Um, um, open for questions, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you very much. I'm going to let the rest uh, to ask their questions first, if there's any. I don't see anything. Okay, so uh, thank you once again for the presentation, Neil. Um, the, one of the main questions that uh, we need to go through when you know we're talking on the Infinite Way of uh, and this project uh, is uh, how you're going to adapt all the lessons learned uh, to your actual business plan. You know, after running this for almost four years now, uh, there are many lessons I guess uh, you have been receiving and learning uh, through this process. So, how do you? plan to adjust your business plan after the, the Infintech project is over? Two aspects of the business plan won't change. Mm -hmm. um, number one is to grow our traction with NGOs around the world who have access to more survivor stories. Um, and the work that we're doing with you will adjust the way we seek to access that material. Currently, we ask a series of questions. We have a, a frame, a, a data collection frame um, with classifications. Quite clearly, going forward, we are going to need additional material from those survivors that help understand that the money situation associated with trafficking patterns uh, as we go. Um, but uh, what we'll need to do is to grow our capacity to manage more organizations joining us. So that's a key challenge for our business plan and, and our fiscal sustainability as, a, as an entity. We are a, a subset of the Stop the Traffic group who are specialists in uh, preventing human trafficking and they use communications across the world to um, to sensitize vulnerable communities to the potential for trafficking uh, and how to and how to avoid falling into the trap because trafficking is 99 percent deception it's trick come for this great job in England come for this great job in Ireland um, and when you get there you don't speak the language um, easy or much of the language and you find yourself not being paid and then you find yourself in greater and greater um, difficulty um, so that that will change uh, and, and then managing the relationships with the financial services sector one thing I've discovered during the course of this program is, is that financial services businesses are very demanding they they need time explanation they need training um, and we're going to have to scale up to do more of that um so so we'll just hang on to your coattails um and, and do our best to deliver that thank you it's, it's an amazing thing what you're doing and uh, really we are here to support you in every way we can it's not just under this project you know that uh, you know all of us are working in many different projects we have partners so whatever you need for example thinking now even uh, access to NGOs here in Greece uh, please get in touch because this is you know very important and uh, thank you for doing that uh, but in any way thanks anyway for your presentation uh, I'm gonna go to the next one and we can keep discussing this I'm gonna send here a, a feedback form uh, for the rest of the teams to go, please, please spend a few minutes. It's going to take three, three minutes to to reply to this. Uh, please use your financial capacity, not as part of the Infinity project, but as your role in uh, your organizations uh, to reply uh, to this feedback form. Uh, I'm going to give you like three minutes. Please go 
uh, write it down so we don't forget about it because it uh, it tends to happen like this uh, and we can come back and start with a pilot for presentation um thank you i will be back in three minutes thanks very much thank you again Neil. i think we are good to go now thank you all for filling out the forms um the next uh, pilot who will present is pilot four um the topic is about personalized portfolio management i believe anna uh, is the one who's gonna present yes perfect thank you we can see your screen hi roland hi Th theodorus hi everybody so the floor is yours. Uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Yeah, then thank you very much um, uh, that we have the, uh, the, the chance to present the uh, current status of Pilot 4 today. Um, uh, let's say our overall topic was always how we can establish private banking practices, best practices uh, available for everyone. Uh, and that's where we are working on in the past uh, three to four years. Uh, Anna, please go ahead. Um, uh, just to summarize again, in the end, uh, it was this private banking-like advisory journey, which should be, in the end, AI-based and mainly technology-driven, so that it could be offered to a broader class of customers, because, as we all know, private banking services from traditional banks you can only normally get if you have at least, let's say, 250,000 euro or even higher, up to 500 or up to 1 million euro on the table. If you have lower budgets, which is the vast majority of the investors, of course, uh, then uh, typically you only get some standardized portfolio solutions, but nothing uh, uh, customized or personalized. Yeah. And therefore, the tasks have been... Um, no, uh, can you go back one, uh, Anna, please? Uh, the first task was being to enable the investors to give their preferences. Uh, we see this right now in all the current market environments, ESG is evolving. Uh, any kind of uh, uh, SDG goals, like um, somebody does not want to invest in weapons or in, in nuclear power plants and so on. And exactly these preferences investors can select. And then uh, this selection can be based in any kind of portfolio construction based on these individual preferences. Yeah? Uh, for that, we use data from different sources. There is also one partner in the uh, pilot, which is Report Brain, which we also use as a source, let's say like a kind of a social media impact, which can be factored in here. And for that, we then uh, created this uh, uh, risk target uh, evalu evaluation and all the uh, processes for creating portfolios. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, uh, the whole journey in, let's say, as always in advisory processes within uh, portfolio management is you need to onboard your investor with your risk profiling, uh, definition of risk return goals. Um, here also a role of report brain makes sense uh, with the sentiment analysis and any kind of preferences I mentioned already before may be coming up from the investors. Yeah. Then we put this in as we call it as fitness factors yeah, because Typically, historically, the fitness factor would only be performance or risk reduction. Right now, we have many more different fitness factors like uh, ESG preferences, regional preferences, asset class preferences, um, which is uh, factored in here and where, in the end, the result can be a highly personalized portfolio construction based on the individual investors' preferences. And the output we produce is, of course, uh, which portfolio assets this, in, this investor uh, shall be investing in uh, based on his risk return uh, appetite in the end. Yeah? If they are more uh, profit or more yield oriented, then they get higher return. Or if they want to reduce the risk, then it's a little bit lower return, but also lower risk. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, from the workflow, just to repeat this again, I think we presented already, we start always with this risk profiling, yeah, which is also a regulatory need. We all need to be aware of no financial advisor in Europe can offer any kind of advisory service without knowing the risk profile of his customers. 
uh, which is then uh, resulting in a scoring uh, model. Then we start with the input of the client preferences, where clients can choose different asset classes, sustainability, regions, uh, types of products, ETFs, more cost-efficient product, or even uh, more active uh, asset management. Then we have uh, any kind of fund universe. Uh, the pilot was based for funds now, but it is principally based on multi-asset classes, meaning it's not only possible for funds, but in the advisory business, it's mostly funds which are dealt with here um, to have the fund universe uh, in different uh, areas of products or portfolios. Then we construct the portfolio yeah, where we also have this uh, AI-based uh, optimization algorithm which tries to find the best portfolio given these preference selections which we have uh, collected before that. And afterwards, of course, we need to present the result, uh, meaning where then this portfolio proposal is presented uh, to the advisor and um, hands to the uh, retail investor. And where we also show, okay, what, uh, how good did we reach the risk uh, matrix? How, do, how good did we reach the preferences which were selected from different investment areas? And uh, this is then in the end, uh, of course, the possibility to change something there. For example, if an investor says, okay, I don't want to have a certain product provider in my portfolio. I want to uh, have, I prefer another one, then uh, they can change it. Then we make this uh, slide, this uh, process again, or uh, make the optimization and have a new proposal, having these manual changes in mind. And the final data output then is, as always in financial services industry, either a kind of a report or an order form where uh, the customer then needs to approve and uh, to sign, or this is a data output where we just uh, put in the data which assets needs to be uh, allocated to the portfolio of the customer in which level and for which uh, uh, duration in the end. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, one of the first uh, implementations we built there. This is a, a customer implementation where you exactly can see on the left hand side the risk profiling, which is in that case always calculated in uh, volatility, in, in percentage, but it also can be recalculated in the so called SRRI. Yeah, this is this synthetic risk uh, indicator, uh, which is based on uh, European regulation. And on the right hand side, then you see the proposals and also where it is shown in which asset classes the investor has invested and how the portfolio which has been proposed in the past periods have been performing in different areas like a recent year, one year or even longer back. The same for volatility or other metrics. Next slide, please. Yeah, what did we contribute so far to the general marketplace? Um, of course, we need input factors, which is in most cases, of course, ex if existing portfolios or alternatively any kind of available cash. Um, then the input pool of the investable assets, meaning the selection of products which this advisor wants to provide to his retail investors. Then the different fitness factors, that's also open build so that uh, some uh, advisors can say, I only want to have two or three fitness factors. Others can have six, seven, or even more. Um, that's exactly the definition what the advisor wants to drive his advisory journey. And uh, of course, then any kind of additional parameters, which is uh, based uh, for any kind of investment uh, structure, like a minimum allocation of single assets or a maximum allocation, or the same is in the number of different assets. It's all a little bit also driven by the volume of cash which can or may be invested. Yeah? And the output then, as mentioned already before, it's the fitness factor scores that we uh, show, okay, which fitness factors, which preferences have been fulfilled in which level, like a kind of a percentage. Yeah? And of course, any kind of risk return metrics to show the investor, okay, that's the assumed and potential uh, portfolio uh, performance of the portfolio, volatility of portfolio, or any other kind of metrics which may be defined uh, upfront. The portfolio itself has then the uh, identifiers of the different assets uh, as, of course, as one of the outputs. 
Yeah, coming to the business model and financial plans, I think um, the target group for this uh, kind of service is, of course, any kind of uh, bank, retail and private banks, of course, insurance companies, external asset managers who want to go digital, yeah, who do not want to have only their classical uh, distribution channels, but also want to open up on digital distribution channels and any kind of online brokers who are having already the more, let's call it the more digital native uh, customers uh, right now already. Yeah? Deliveries will be either via standard UI, this is let's say in the B2B space, this may be the uh, uh, option which uh, can be chosen. Um, for uh, the more you go retail, then typically uh, our service will be offered as, as an API service um, where then the, uh, the interested party uh, typically builds his own front-end, uh, customer-facing front-end uh, themselves. On the, let's say, value proposition, I think a typical setup is uh, that any kind of upfront and implementation fees will be collected uh, based on, in the end, any kind of special implementations which need to be done with different of the institutions, like big banks have always their own rules for engagement and uh, for cloud services and so on and uh, plus any kind of recurring fees um, where uh, multiple factors depending on the modules uh, for example with some banks we have uh, run uh, uh, pilots uh, or let's say pucs where uh, we do not do the risk profiling because the bank has already a risk profiling in place uh, for their other business and there we only take then uh, existing risk profiling results into our system and then make only the portfolio construction available. Eh? Um, uh, a trend which we see uh, not so much in Europe so far, but for example in, in the US and in Asia, of course, is this uh, that this uh, will also move towards SaaS fees based models eh? where also usage will be then charged and uh, of course any kind of AUM fee, meaning um, depending on the assets under management, which is managed by such a tool, uh, will be the basis for any kind of fee calculation. Market potential right now uh, seems to be based on all the studies which uh, we have available uh, quite huge because especially in this lower volume segment, um, a big portion of uh, the current um, assets from uh, retail customers is in the end com literally unmanaged. Yeah? They, it's customers who just have bought some securities, funds, equities uh, due to whatever reason and nobody cares about. And I think this will change a little bit as also the new generation, I think, uh, we like to have more kind of a Netflix model of portfolio advisory, meaning they want to choose what they want to see, what they want to have in their portfolio, but they also want to take uh, or, or forward trans responsibility to somebody who takes care then to check every year if this is still accurate, what I have in my portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, what, what we did, I think, mainly starting from 21 is um, we did quite a relevant number already of uh, communication and feedback collections with financial intermediaries, with banks, with insurance companies, make al already several presentations, had projects meetings with one, um, let's say, with one initial customer already, who already went live uh, beginning of this year. Um, but POCs with other interested customers and um, uh, related parties and made a bigger presentation already in the Fonds Congress in Vienna where this was also shared uh, together with one of the customers to present this to this to his advisors, yeah, to make those advisors a little bit more familiar with this kind of tool because um, as we all know in, in this area it's always also a question of that the, the, the distribution channels need to be comfortable with these kind of solutions because otherwise, uh, in many cases, they will not use it. Next slide, please. Yeah, exploitation plan. I think, as always in <clears throat> uh, financial services with, with the bigger banks and maybe one of uh, some of the participants today uh, can can uh, elaborate on that and, and confirm that hopefully, is that uh, you, you always need to make the use case very clear where it can be implemented for any kind of business case for uh, banks, uh, asset managers, insurance companies. Uh, 
um, in parallel, we of course try to identify potential target customers, which are having plans for more digitizing existing business channels uh, of their current business. Um, yeah, and then work on the value proposition. Yeah, I think this is exactly what we mentioned already is one is this personalization because this is definitely a kind of a mega trend that all investors are more and more interested to make their personal portfolio and not to stay with some uh, standard portfolios. Um, yeah, and then start uh, very soon prototyping and, and piloting with customers to show them very soon, okay, how potential results could look like. Um, market launch, I think we anyway already started communicating very much in this area, but uh, as, as we all need to be aware of, we are not alone uh, worldwide here. That's many fintechs or wealth techs are offering similar services, while exactly this combination of advisory plus this uh, portfolio construction on a personalized basis, uh, there is not so much competition as a package. Yeah? For the single tools, there is quite relevant competition, of course. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, pilot roadmap. I think um, that's anyway what we reported already. Um, POCs with uh, one customer, with two customers, have been already finalized. With one is already a project out of that, and uh, other interested insurance companies and banks are right now approached. And uh, we we hope that um, at least some tools or some part of this pilot uh, may be implemented then with further mainly yeah, banking and insurance institutions uh, in the coming, let's say, six to 12 months. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I hope I was um, uh, nearly on time, yeah. That was great, thank you so much. I have a question, when it comes to the total addressable market, that you mentioned three million and then it goes up to 12 trillion, sorry. Uh, is this the fees that are generated uh, by this type of services? Uh, how did you, you know, how you, do you determine this? Uh, how do you define this target market? Yeah, yeah. No, um, as far as, but let me double check that I do not, uh, I think, no, it's it's not the fees, it's the um, um, uh, the assets under management in that area. Yeah. Okay. The fees okay. is then, the, the, it's the addressable market, yeah, meaning this is exactly this, uh, what, what we, uh, what I explained before, that there is, quite a big volume of assets in the end unmanaged. Yeah? Mm -hmm. There is no advisor and no asset manager professionally looking at yeah, because that's typically customers who got some shares from their company, then they bought the fund and then I don't know, some, some real estate bonds and so on, um, uh, which is not uh, professionally managed. And I think this, this will come up more and more because people, especially now, the market condition shows exactly this yeah, because everybody is scared now a little bit because of the market downturn since since uh, March, April. Yeah, and it will mm -hmm. go down further. It's my expectation at least. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, everybody is scared. Yeah, but in the end, uh, the mistake has already happened. But now I think the approach is to motivate more people to have a professionally managed service here. Yeah? either mm -hmm. to go to an asset manager, then they don't care at all, or at least consult an advisor where the final decision stays always regulatory wise with the uh, investor itself, because the advisor is only allowed to advise and not to manage. Yeah? That's the regulatory difference. Yeah? Um, and uh, there we see uh, quite a good trend of exactly those smaller uh, uh, volumes uh, to be managed more professionally and to help financial institutions to allow this, yeah, they need to have an automated process. Yeah, because why is it that the banks only offer private banking services for people with 500,000? Yeah? Because their internal cost for this service is so high that uh, they cannot afford to do it for somebody who's coming with 10,000. Yeah? And Correct. therefore, I think this is exactly the business case for the robo-advisors. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the robo-advisors, again, is not making a continuous uh, consulting yeah? they are just there you invest fill in your risk profile and then you invest and that's it yeah two years later if this works out well or not so well the robot advisor does not care to be honest yeah and i think this is exactly the the change in the mindset we need to uh, motivate and um, that that's also one of the changes i see from this insurance company in in uh, it's one of the biggest ones in in germany and austria 
that's exactly what they said. I need to motivate my advisors who have the customer contact yeah, to address and go to them on a yearly basis and not only show up once when they want to get their commission and then they have right. never seen the customer the next 10 years. Yeah? And that's that's exactly this change in behavior. It's a little bit regulatory driven yeah? because also if it says now that these advisors need to go back and check their customer's risk profile every year if it's accurate enough still and so on. Yeah? Um, and I think this is exactly this, this uh, procedures which need to be how to say implemented in the in the whole industry yeah yeah no no totally thank you for that and I have one more question you mentioned uh, on the exploitation uh, strategy about the SWOT analysis uh, can you give us like a few examples on the weaknesses and threats that you see yeah uh, for yeah. this of course yeah, the, the weakness and in the end that's also the lessons learned to be honest mm -hmm. uh, of, of the last three four years yeah um, uh, the approach to offer this kind of service to let's say a 10,000 uh, euro uh, portfolio is a good idea but it also needs to be followed by some restrictions because it makes no sense with 10,000 euro to invest in 30 different assets because the investment in uh, per asset is 300 euro and all the transaction fees and so on is much too high and therefore you need to do some restrictions on the number of assets which is allowed the type of assets the number of fitness factors yeah and i think this is this is a little bit the learning curve we all need to have yeah that's this this trade off between highest flexibility to be offered to the investor yeah but not to overload it then if there is only less money on the table yeah? because um, and I think this is this is exactly what we what we need to define more altogether. It's it's not not only us, the software provider. It's it's also the banks or the asset managers, yeah, to make this kind of offerings for this savings plan offerings. Yeah? It's it's exactly the same. Yeah, if if you offer a savings plan with two hundred euros per month, yeah, you cannot invest in ten assets. Yeah, because then every month for every asset you invest twenty euros let's say yeah and i think this is exactly what what needs to be considered yeah and and the whole execution line yeah i think uh, every bank uh, suffers under execution cost and therefore it's it's also uh, high needs to be highly efficient before such an offering in the total business case makes sense yeah okay fair enough uh, and it's a very interesting case and i guess this is what you need to be talking with clients and protection clients to find out how they can you know structure this uh, in a better way thank you very much for the presentation roland uh, and the others, uh, okay. yes sorry roland can i just ask you something because you, you mentioned a very interesting point here and that is uh, to restrict the, the the offering according to the kind of uh, in investment because as you, as you pointed out this can be a rather expensive undertaking uh, how do you intend because I, I could imagine it's quite difficult to communicate to a customer and uh, you know particularly if they're on the beginning so when you want to make it available to the mass market uh, what they can and cannot choose because I can imagine it that uh, if you take your next door neighbor you know they know about uh, uh, Coca-Cola, they know about uh, uh, the, the mainstream Apple, Microsoft, maybe they have come across. So that's why I think uh, Revolut had a significant success going just into the mainstream big items uh, in the US uh, where it is relatively cheap to, to, to invest. Uh, so, so how do you want to tackle or how do you anticipate to tackle that the kind of challenge? Yeah, um, a very good question. And I think this is one of the deciding business points. Um, I, I can, uh, let's say, and to be honest, potentially there is not the, not the full and clear answer for now. But what we see from the successful business cases is, and there we need to separate always between the asset management business cases, where they really, the customers give a mandate, and in the end, then the asset manager has quite a high freedom in investing and needs to only restrict his internal flexibility. Yeah? Um, in the asset management services, it's, I think, uh, quite typical right now, they build baskets. Yeah? There you have a basket, let's say, for, for um, nutrition, yeah? where then Coca-Cola and whatever is in there. Yeah? Then they have a basket for, let's call it electromobility. Yeah? There is Tesla and BMW and whatever is in there. And then they just, uh, let's say, build the baskets in relation to each other. Yeah? Say, okay, this is my basket for 
if if the customer told me okay he's interested in in e-health or if he's interested in electromobility then he gets the basket and it's the asset manager's decision if he then invests in the basket in two assets or in three or in four yeah um in the advisory case it's a little bit more tricky but in the end like insurance companies because insurance companies are mostly advisor yeah they are not doing asset management as a per definition um and there it needs to in the end it, the the financial services provider needs to make a decision yeah needs to restrict it to say okay i have 200 assets yeah and also disclose it yeah i, I think transparency is key here and disclose it okay i have a basket for commodities i have a basket for um uh, let's say uh, esg for um, um environmental protection or for mega trends yeah and there they have two or three assets in there that may be good ones maybe not so good ones but they need to take over the responsibility because in the end in the advisory business it's always deciding that finally the customer decides yeah it's the advisor only makes a proposal and the cust and if you can show the advisor uh, if you can show the investor that the proposal was made under certain assumptions and if you disclose this yeah then it's also obviously not a regulatory issue because then you have disclosed what was the basis for your decision um, and then you build or you construct the portfolio based on that, uh, let's say, uh, assets which are listed. Therefore, I mentioned before that um, many insurance companies, for example, uh, work with uh, mutual funds or ETFs. Yeah? And for example, this uh, insurance company where this first solution went live uh, is one of the biggest ones in Germany in life insurance area. And they only have 200 assets in their portfolios. They do not offer more. And between the 200, then every customer gets around about, uh, I would say, between five to eight, they get in their portfolios. And that's it. Yeah? And I think this is exactly this business decision needs to be taken. Yeah, Because um, otherwise, if you offer whole New York Stock Exchange and whole German Stock Exchange, it, it, it will end up in big problems in execution. Yeah? That's These decisions need to be taken. And I think this is... This is also accepted yeah? because if you go to uh, let's say to a standard portfolio with with the classical retail bank right now then you also only get the fund of fund you get one asset yeah? and they also it cannot be chosen uh, what what you what you want to have there and um, uh, therefore the offering to have more personalization via such a tool which we developed here is even much more convenient than just uh, go for the classical standard offering yeah i'm not sure does this answer your question yeah i, I think you you made it exactly to the point uh, i mean the, the personalization the, the, if i may summarize i would say the personalization degree comes with a cost so obviously as a customer the, the more you want the more you have to uh, actually pay for it in the end of the day uh, again uh, very often it's not uh, important not to overcomplicate things uh, and therefore you know by keeping it rather small it comes as an advantage because the story becomes easier and and can be communicated uh, more simplistic so exactly you. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah exactly yeah uh, i think here it counts less is more uh, if, <laughs> i think in german weniger ist mehr but yeah. uh, i think this this counts here because uh, without that approach in my personal opinion any kind of digitization is anyway failing yeah digitization leaves from uh, lives from or the success of it is very much dependent and really much streamlining the whole process not so much lefts and rights just straightforward yeah and uh, some decisions need to be taken and in the end then you anyway can adapt afterwards if you find out that some of your decisions have been wrong because it does not work and nobody's interested in then you anyway need to change it yeah but um, uh, it makes no sense to make the the full buffet always yeah and then customers get confused because they do not know where to where to start yeah? and uh, mm. there i think uh, a straightforward process is is uh, is the choice which uh, we should take here. Yeah. Thank you both. Thank you, Ron, for the nice presentation. Thank you, Anna, for the work and the rest of the team. Uh, thank you, Shelby, for the question. Uh, let's 
let's go ahead with the next uh, pilot. But before that, as uh, we did earlier, I'm going to send you the feedback form here. Uh, so let's spend three minutes. Uh, just remember, use your capacity as, you know, whatever your role is in your current organization, not as part of the Infinitec, uh, to make sure that uh, these results are more um, objective. Uh, please, Anna and Roland, don't, don't go and do that for now. Uh, so let's come back in three minutes. Thank you once again. Uh, we will be back for Pilot 5B. We're back. Thanks for filling it out. Uh, so we're going to head with um, Pilot 5B. Silvio, whenever you're ready, you can start with the presentation. And if you can hear me. Yep. Sorry about that. Don't worry. Let's go for it. Okay, so basically, uh, thanks uh, everybody for joining this uh, call and the opportunity to present to you the Pilot 5B. The Pilot 5B deals with uh, a tool that is geared towards small, medium enterprises and uh, it is a uh, uh, deliverable uh, through a collaboration between a number of parties with the major ones being the University of uh, Piraeus, the research center, as well as the Bank of Cyprus. So I will kind of uh, recap what are we talking about. We are talking about assisting the small medium enterprises which uh, traditionally have been neglected within the market. Now, there was a particular reason for that, and that uh, being that uh, SMEs in its nature, they're very different uh, to each other and obviously from corporates uh, and other players. And, and therefore, it was sheer too, too expensive to address the uh, each individual SME. Now, the idea uh, uh, underlying here was uh, how can we help them? How can we make a tool that addresses their individuality, but at the same time, you know, ensures that uh, it adds uh, the value which is required for, for each uh, of the SMEs? And uh, we have come up with a kind of uh, PFM, Business Financial Management Toolkit, that looks into a sort of engine, engines but the importance here is not to have the engine per se but rather more the combination of these engines and the combination is represented uh, what you can see here on this slide in the middle through the smart virtual advisor so we know today there are solutions existing which do uh, transaction categorization uh, we know there are various tools uh, doing cash flow prediction or, or budgeting and, and invoicing but so far, what is missing in the market is a really a uh, solution that spans across the engines and not in terms of uh, processing the, the underlying functionality, but rather more uh, taking the result and uh, kind of analyzing the results in relation to the various outputs of the, the, the engines. Um, aspect what we felt uh, would be a very important which is very often still neglected is the the user feedback uh, the kind of user behavior uh, loop so having a model uh, doing something uh, it's a status quo but it, it doesn't really uh, contribute towards a continuous improvement uh, cycle and that is why we, we felt that it's of high importance to have this kind of feedback uh, loop incorporated within the overall offering now, the uh, proof of concept from Pilot 5B is a part of a, a bigger story within the Bank of Cyprus. Uh, we have uh, started uh, approximately five years ago the digital transformation journey. And uh, recently, we have uh, also uh, uh, or basically uh, presented to the market a, a platform, a digital economy platform. We believe that's the direction to go. And uh, of this platform is to uh, simplify the everyday business. So it addresses not only legal entities, it also goes to in, but overall it, it shares the common objective, the common aim uh, is to uh, uh, assist 
entities as well as individuals in their daily life, whatever that might be. So that's the big story. Under these big stories we have started, we have uh, already acquired uh, uh, a significant number of uh, legal entities, uh, and I think at present we are around uh, 1,500, uh, which participate within the platform. And as they go by, the offering is increased uh, more and more. The fits into this overall concept. So the idea is that these engines, which are produced on a single basis as well, then later on being combined to incorporate into the platform offering. Uh, on this slide, what you can see is the basic setup. So obviously on the left-hand side, it all starts with the data collection process. And here we start collecting data from the bank side. We collecting data from the platform side and uh, external providers. So here it's actually quite nicely where things uh, come together. We know that traditionally banks have a fast amount of data when it comes to transactions. So the, the transactions the customers uh, uh, perform. What they are not uh, obviously so knowledgeable about is a kind of uh, accounting system uh, parameters, values, uh, which traditionally come uh, SAP, uh, you have Xero, QuickBooks, uh, et, et cetera, who operate within this space. So the, the, the kind of key here is to combine the various data streams to utilize them, uh, do the, the processing number crunching, as I would call it, in, in the middle part here, where you see uh, reflected through the Infinitech color, the red, and then at the right hand side, there is where we go back to the customer and kind of present the, the findings we have and uh, the action items we believe uh, should be pursued. Now, the, uh, one, one of the uh, engines which we want to include as a first deliverable within this uh, platform offering is the cash flow component. The cash flow component uh, is one of the engines of this uh, PFM toolkit and it uh, utilizes uh, already the, the output from another engine which is the transaction categorization. So with this one uh, we have gone to the marketplace, we have uh, developed a, uh, a video outlining how uh, this can be uh, used and then operated and uh, represents, uh, I would say, the, the, the first key item within the, the offering and uh, works towards proving that the uh, Infinitech platform uh, works uh, in its fit for purpose. Now, uh, at, at present, the, uh, the, the setup is that we anticipated to use the, our own testbed, but because the bank mainly operates on, on a different cloud environment, and then to what has been chosen by Infinitech, it, it proved to be quite cumbersome and, and difficult for us, and that's why we continued on the testbed uh, environment, uh, which is provided by Infinitech. Now, when it comes to the uh, financial uh, plans, uh, the uh, the, the tool we anticipate, uh, it's not something we want to charge as, as a kind of standalone offering because it is an added value, which uh, we believe uh, will be actually of massive uh, impact to the legal entity, but it, it comes like under the wider offering of the platform. So in the platform we have different, we have a subscription based model, uh, depending what subscription level you choose, uh, you pay. And uh, in one of these levels, the uh, BFM offering will be incorporated as well, or part of it. So we can there then uh, still in the process of deciding how to split it. And uh, it will come uh, as part of the overall income. Uh, as I mentioned already before, it is not intended to, to complete all the, the, the engines and, and all the uh, insights generation and then go to, to market. It is a kind of uh, MVP approach where we, we have said, okay, as a minimum, we need to have that in place and uh, proceed to the market. And then together with the market uh, and step-by-step step, uh, continuously improve the offering. The, uh, just to, to have an idea of uh, what we're looking here, uh, we, we said before that it's uh, the buyer is basically legal entities uh, on, on, the, on the platform and there at the moment there's like a 35 subscription charge per month and uh, when at the 
potential. At the moment, we have uh, 40,000 legal entities within the country which could uh, benefit from this uh, offering. So uh, that's how, how we, we anticipate it. So obviously, uh, 40,000 is very ambitious, but we believe that we can capture significant market uh, share from that. Looking at the, the evaluation of the, the, the pilot, uh, obviously it is uh, very important to be aligned. Uh, happy with regards to the various dimensions uh, that the levels we, we have achieved and uh, continue to, to engage with our stakeholders and customers from the platform, which will have already been onboarded to, to see uh, what they anticipate as value, how they believe it, it can add uh, to their operation and uh, design and then implement the offering accordingly. Now the, the exploitation, uh, so what's the big info for the bank of uh, having participated within this uh, Infinitech project? Now the various aspects. Uh, one uh, obviously is that, uh, like Roland already mentioned in his presentation, uh, software as a service becomes more and more important. And then I see that one in, in the bank. So more and more products we deploy are, are based on, on that kind of uh, philosophy. And therefore having generated the additional knowledge of uh, how components work work and, and what does it actually mean, uh, it adds a significant value to the bank. The uh, tool that being developed uh, is intended for the uh, small medium enterprises, but as one can imagine, uh, it uh, also can be uh, with a minor adoption uh, be made uh, uh, suitable for the retail customers, so that's going to be the added uh, value. And recapping from the, the platform mentioning is that we have both streams we have the legal entities on the platform as well as the the retail customers so uh, once we have uh, completed the the legal entities then it's the logic uh, step to to utilize what we have implemented there and uh, also apply to the retail customers now uh, another uh, important point is uh, obviously what has been uh, learned and, and uh, developed as part of the engagement uh, to publicize, to make available uh, to the wider market in, ter in terms of uh, research papers and conference participation. When uh, it comes to the uh, roadmap, uh, so there uh, at present, uh, it's the integration of the platform. We are still uh, working on, on that one, uh, finding it the right way. Uh, so uh, we continuously uh, operate on, on, on that basis to, to sit together with the University of Bavaria's uh, how we can uh, address the, the needs in the best way and, and utilize what we have developed so far and what we will develop uh, in due course. And that concludes the presentation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Silvio, uh, for the presentation. Um, let's start with any anyone who has a question for you. Uh, feel free now to ask Silvio. If not, uh, I have some questions uh, coming from uh, Mr. Kalagirakis. Um, so I would like to go and ask you actually how how do you access uh, assess the ethical and any other environmental or social societal uh, dimensions of uh, your system? Basically, I think it's it's a very good point, and and I I see it. For example, when when you look, one of the components is the invoice component. Today, uh, we know that big companies, they, they have uh, SAP, uh, one SAP business suite and whatever you will name, um, they're quite comfortable with having a kind of digital process in place. But when you go, once you go to the SMEs, there you will find a lot of paper. So it's in the warehouse, the guy goes down to the warehouse, he has his three papers, invoice, invoice copy, etc. The one in the warehouse takes one piece of the paper, he puts it there, he takes the goods, he loads it into the trolley, the driver will take another two pieces of paper, go to the customer, customer signing, uh, etc. So there, there's a lot of, uh, I, I think, uh, utilization to be made in order to become more green uh, to, to optimize the processes to put everybody more on the digital process to have uh, the, the whole payment system so for example now on the platform you would uh, utilize with a one click uh, uh, the uh, electronic payment so you you eliminate cash from from the the process 
which again, that means that people drive less to the branches to collect the cash, they drive less to the branches to deliver the cash, there is less counting involved, that means it's not only time and effort, but it's also pollution, uh, I, would, I would say. So th there are a number of, of items which we can do by reducing uh, uh, and, and having a positive impact on the uh, environment. Perfect. Great, great stuff. And, you know, keep keep doing this. It's very useful every little bit that uh, we can do to support uh, all these uh, huge issues. Um, perfect. That was it. Thank you. Thank you Thank once you again. Much, uh, let me send the, the, the feedback form here. Uh, please take a few minutes for the rest to, to go and reply. And we're coming back for the last uh, pilot uh, presentation from uh, Manolis and Pilot 6. Uh, so let's we will be back in three minutes to start with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for uh, doing this. Uh, so we are gonna head uh, gonna head with the last uh, pilot for today. Uh, it's pilot six, and uh, the topic about uh, about this is a personalized closed loop investment portfolio management for retail customers. Uh, so, Manolis, uh, I guess you are the one who's going to present. No, no, sorry. Ah. Hi, it's Manolis. It's Gino ah. Prokopaki and Verdicuri Eleni. Hi, hi both. Sorry, I can see Manolis on the, on the yes, name. Yes, that's, that's why. true, because uh, this We're is our account, account yes. yes, for Infinitech. That's why. That's that's not the problem <laughs> at all. Apologies for this. So, feel free uh, to share your screen and start with the presentation. Okay, just give me The floor me is yours. Yes. Second. Can you all see? Yes, we can. If you want to go full screen as well. Yes. Fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we're uh, in Pilot 6 actually developing personalized and intelligent, and intelligent investment recommendations for retail customers. So we're developing algorithms, uh, utilizing technology, utilizing data, as we will see in the next slides, and of course, uh, with various partnerships in order to identify uh, which are the ideal recommendations for retail customers. The business motivation behind this is that uh, we are actually uh, using all the information that we have, uh, customer behavior analytics, and also we are automating recommendations for our retail customers, uh, aiming actually to, to utilize and leverage also a large data sets and actually uh, leads to increased trading volumes for uh, utilizing also this not only for the high affluent ones and make it available but also uh, to all customers now uh, we have various data sources uh, included uh, after the data harmonization and the data management part uh, which includes of course cleansing and an anonymization we have applied machine learning uh, as well as uh, AI with the support not from report brain as you can see uh, PyTorx, better essays and at the end including also the business logic from NBG while the final end and this is the point that we are now is that we are creating a GUI for available for the financial advisor so as uh, the last milestone before communicating to the customer all um, the proposals in any case. Now, this is uh, a first uh, screenshot, uh, as you can see, of the GUI. It's uh, a very friendly one, very fast. And uh, the greatest value is the fact that it includes consolidated info per customer. In the first screen, uh, the financial advisor can see all the basic information of the customer. So some descriptives, um, uh, some info of the asset that he had in the past in his possession. In the second one, uh, actually in more deep, the investment history part. While the third screen includes all the recommendations, uh, just a, a comment here that uh, one of the most um, important parts is that we've seen recommendation engines in the past. 
This one includes info in a quite low level, and this is actually what makes it so important. Now, um, AKS cluster is already completed, connections are on track, and we're aiming to give uh, access to the final users in order to proceed with a proper test. Our part for marketplace, our contribution includes sample data, transactional data, and of course all the available models uh, consolidated in the recommendation engine. Now, in terms of users, as we've already mentioned in the past, financial advisors uh, will have actually the opportunity to provide more personalized propositions, more targeted. Thus, uh, there will be enhancing customer experience, increasing uh, productivity. And of course, uh, lead at the end the retail customers to targeted investment choices, making actually uh, through this process uh, the financial advisor more loyal, increase the customer experience, and of course, increase the trading volumes as well as the whole activity behind this. We have contributed and participated in various workshops, just uh, high level mentioning the internal workshop in September, uh, the Greek fintech cluster in November, internal workshop in September, and uh, the second cluster uh, of Infinitech workshop in March. There's also the final presentation to the stakeholders mm -hmm. in the future. What we need to mention here is that actually uh, this whole uh, process, this whole implementation, including the GUI, will be utilized only by MBG. And while for MBG subsidiaries, it could be considered in the future to be utilized only as a service and nothing more than that. Um, and aiming, as we previously mentioned, to uh, create more automated processes to increase customer um, experience, to improve customer experience, to increase acceptance rates, uh, the trading volumes, and so on. Just let me now repeat what I've already mentioned. Sorry, I need to, to close just for one second. Okay. Okay. Can you can you see my screen? Because I think that it was yes. Oh. You are on the lessons learned now. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> the right one. So um, so far we have managed to extend the clientele. So provide this and make it applicable not only to the most high affluent customers but also to everyone. As I mentioned already, if the financial advisor is actually now in a state of being more loyal, as he has in his hands a, an enriched recommendation engine, while I need to highlight again the holistic view provided through the GUI, uh, where actually all influence co is consolidated there. Uh, whilst uh, another comment just to highlight also this is that the information and the proposals are made in a low quite low level compared to others in the market. Just uh, mentioning that we are actually uh, as per plan and we're moving on with the next uh, activities in order to, to go live uh, uh, according to the schedule that we've already communicated and agreed to. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for that. Uh, are there any questions for Pilot 6? If not, one of the main things that uh, we are asked, and I mean for all pilots, and you need to have it in the deliverables, and I think you all have it anyway, but uh, it's uh, regarding the technology readiness levels, uh, the, so the TLRs. Uh, have you uh, achieved the expected TRL levels right now, as you are, or is there anything missing? And if not, why? So we're actually working towards uh, 
the final one in order to consolidate as uh, because as i mentioned previously there are a lot of uh, parties contributing actually here so we need to complete the consolidation and after the testing i think that we will be able to say that we will have reached the expected level fantastic great to hear that and i'm sure that you will have it ready uh perfect that's that was the question thank you very much for the presentation Thank, Thank you, all you. the team working on this. Uh, so I'm going to send you here the, the form, the feedback form. Uh, take a few minutes, a couple of minutes. Let's come back for the close of this event. And uh, yeah, just get back in two minutes. Thank you. OK, thank you for completing the, the form. Uh, we will send you the form so you can share it with uh, your external stakeholders as well and any other potential clients or partners that you have for this program. Um, this concludes our today's workshop. So that was part of the Infinitech project and uh, this was actually to present our current stage and get feedback from uh, external partners. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for the presentations. Keep up the good work and uh, we will be in touch very soon for the next steps. Um, have a great day ahead. Thank you very much, Theodore. Have a good Thank day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.